The moon is covered by craters. 5,185 of them, in fact, are over 12 miles, 19 kilometers across, and around 1 million of them are over half a mile, 0.80 kilometers in length. And if you want to go even further, there are probably more than 500 million craters, 10 meters or 32 feet in length. The point is, the moon has seen more physical abuse than Krillin of Dragon Ball and you'd probably be less than surprised if one of those impacts knocked something loose. Well, that's exactly what we're talking about today on ScienceGAD. An asteroid currently orbiting the Earth is thought to have originated from the Moon. But how do astronomers know this? And is there a chance that this thing could hit us in the future? Let's find out. But before we jump in, be sure to do the thing and like, comment, join the mailing list, and subscribe. I'm Eric Malachite, author of Echoes of Olympus Mons, and this is ScienceGAD. <laughs> The Earth does not just have one moon, technically speaking at least. That may come as a surprise, but near-Earth objects are sometimes captured by the Earth's gravity well and end up orbiting us for a short period of time. Sure, none of those objects are very large, and there is some debate whether or not the dust clouds orbiting the Earth in two of our Lagrange points count as moons, but the 41-meter, 134-foot asteroid known as 2016 HO3 Kamo is of particular interest to scientists because it may be a long-lost piece of the moon. Now, 2016 HO3 is designated as a near-Earth object and a fast rotator. It completes a rotation every 28.3 minutes. 2016 HO3 is also classified as a quasi-satellite. There are only five known quasi-satellites orbiting Earth, and they're all pretty hard to spot because of how frickin' small they are. They also orbit really close to the Earth. For example, 2016 HO3 orbits at an average distance of 13 lunar distances, which really isn't that close to us, but is still close in astronomical terms. 2016 HO3 is also the most stable of these quasi-satellites, as it's been orbiting the Earth for about a century at this point, with yearly observations being the most favorable starting in April. This mini-moon will continue to orbit our planet for centuries to come, and will probably never come closer than within 9 million miles, 14 million kilometers of the Earth, so there's virtually no chance of it hitting us. That's always an important note anytime you're talking about an asteroid, and I'm sure a few people will hit up that comment section claiming that NASA is lying and something really is going to hit us sometime circa whenever that new doomsday date is now. Like that one cult on Parks and Rec that constantly has to change the date of the apocalypse. Why can't cults be harmless like them? But what's most interesting about this object, and what makes the scientists behind a paper published in the scientific journal Nature by Benjamin N. L. Sharkey, Vishnu Reddy, and various other contributors, is actually its hue, or rather, as the paper's abstract calls it, its spectrum. In the newly released paper, the authors describe quasi-satellite 2016 HO3 Kamau Aulaba as having a rotational speed of 28.3 minutes and displays a red and reflectance spectrum of 0.4 to 2.2 microns. This spectrum is indicative of a silicate-based composition, but with reddening beyond what is typically seen amongst asteroids in the inner solar system. In order to view the asteroid in visible and near-infrared wavelengths, Sharkey and company used the Large Binocular Telescope and the Lowell Discovery Telescope to measure 2016 HO3's reddish hue, and determined that based on their findings that the silicates of the object were more than likely lunar in origin. That's pretty awesome, and if you don't think so, maybe this will put things into perspective. We've discovered roughly 371 lunar meteorites on Earth, but I don't think we've ever had any evidence of a near-Earth object being a piece of old Luna. More on this later. Richard Binzel, a planetary scientist at MIT who did not contribute to the new paper, says, An object in a quasi-satellite orbit is interesting because it's very difficult to get into this kind of orbit. It's not the kind of orbit that an object from the asteroid belt could easily find itself caught in. Kamau Al Lava seems to reflect sunlight along longer, more reddish wavelengths. And while that is unlike any near-Earth asteroid in the inner solar system, what is similar to most of the space rocks floating around the old Sol System shooting gallery 
It's the grains of silicate rock that we brought back from the moon thanks to the astronauts who landed there during Apollo 14. Richard Benzel thinks that this is pretty clear evidence that the object was ejected from the moon due to a cratering event. Which we will simulate here because asteroid impacts are fun and I own Universe Sandbox. Just imagine being able to see an impact on the moon like this from Earth. Not the size that I meant, but okay, thanks computer. But even as researchers involved with the study get excited for this possibility, Martin Connors, the man who discovered the first quasi-satellite, says that scientists should be cautious with this new data, as despite it being well-founded in evidence, it could still be wrong. If this data is correct, however, it would be unprecedented, and maybe that's a good reason to be skeptical. Going back to what I was saying earlier about the moon's craters, we've discovered 371 lunar meteorites on the Earth's surface. Looking up to the moon, we can see that the near side is littered with craters. The far side appears to have more craters, but the large shallow basins on the near side are unique, posing questions like where the hell did all those large craters come from? As a side note, I just realized that looking up at the moon was the first sentence I ever uttered here on ScienceGet a little over a year ago today. Wow. Happy belated birthday, Science Cat. Now back to your regularly scheduled programming. The idea used to be that these larger craters on the near side of the moon were caused by larger asteroids than those that bombarded the far side. Dark side for you Pink Floyd fans. But that explanation doesn't totally hold water. In a 2013 study, it was revealed that in the moon's distant past, the near side was a lot warmer than it is today. We all know that the moon is tidally locked, but apparently the far side ended up cooling much more rapidly, creating a solid crust, while the near side melted like butter and featured great lava flows. The team behind the study used data from NASA's Gravity Recovery and Interior Laboratory Mission, GRAIL, which are a couple of satellites devoted to creating a gravitational map of the moon's surface. Yes, I know that sounds like science fiction, but it's a thing. We have gravity maps on Earth, in fact. The team used these gravity maps to take accurate measurements of the lunar basins we're so familiar with. While both sides, or hemispheres, of the moon are nearly identical as far as the quantity of craters are concerned, the far side only has one impact crater larger than 320 kilometers in diameter, while the near side has eight of them. The theory is that any asteroid bombardment would have hammered both near side and far side evenly, but because the near side was comparatively warmer, like butter, then a smaller asteroid, which would typically create a smaller crater, could cause way more damage than otherwise would be possible. And it's my opinion that this difference in temperature could also explain this quasi-satellite. So I posit the question, is it possible that the temperature difference between the near side and far side of the moon, a difference of hundreds of degrees, could have made the lunar surface more susceptible to losing material? If only I could drag a scientist on here to answer these questions. In any case, we'll have to wait and see how this story develops. Right now, China's space program is planning to send some kind of probe to Kamau Alava in the hopes of bringing back samples to the Earth. That should be happening sometime this decade. But what do you think? Do you think my hypothesis holds water, or helium-3 at least? Let me know down in the comments. If you dug this video, drop me a like, smash that subscribe button, ring that notifications bell, and hey, if you dig asteroid content, check out this video on the largest comet ever discovered. It's huge, and it's coming right for us. And wow, check out all those wonderful names. Thank you, patrons. I'm Eric Malachite, and I'll see you next time. Eccentric performance.